This message today is the third in a four-part series that we're doing on the theme of connecting. We talked the last couple of weeks about connecting with God. Today we're going to talk about connecting with one another. And then next week, Lord willing, we'll talk about connecting with the community. And I mentioned over the last couple of weeks that your Pastor John introduced this word to us as we've talked about our Capital Fund campaign and the idea of connecting and also connecting that with our remodeling project and all that's intertwined because that's the reason why we're doing all of the remodeling. Is it, is it just to add space or to um, make our church building look better, but it's to connect with God and with one another and with our community. And so that's been the emphasis. And I've, I've talked about the campaign a little bit, but I also want to give you a little bit more information and you'll be hearing more about it as the months go forward. But we're planning on having a commitment Sunday sometime this spring where we can commit to paying off the loan financially that we've taken out. I'll tell you more about that here in a moment. And then next Sunday, what we're planning on doing is taking up an offering that we're, we're calling a seed offering. It's an offering to kind of start the momentum and get us going in the direction that we need to go to pay for the remodeling. And so we're going to have a special offering next Sunday, so I hope that you'll pray about that and pray what the Lord would have you to give. But also keep in mind that the Commitment Sunday will be what God leads us to give over the next several years. And so this next Sunday won't be the only opportunity to give, but it will be an offering to kind of get us moving in that direction. I mentioned that I would share a little bit about the loan. I talked about it at the annual business meeting a couple of weeks ago, but the cost of the project is going to be in the neighborhood of $534,000. We have secured a loan for $250,000 that we're going to be paying back at a clip of $4,700 a month. And so that's the purpose of the capital fund campaign, to pay off that loan. And that will be a big focus on for these next several years. So that's the loan, $250,000. The rest of it we had in our building fund, or at least most of that, in our building fund. And so we need the loan then to supplement the, the rest of that payment. But again, all of this is about connecting, about connecting with God, about connecting with one another, and connecting to our community. And so today we're going to talk about connecting with one another and how we can do that effectively. And there are many different directions you could go with this. Um, this is only one. I'm just going to be kind of scratching the surface today, but I think there's some important things that we can learn and do and practice in our daily lives to connect with one another in the church. And we're going to read 1 Thessalonians 5, beginning at verse 8, where Paul says, but since we are of the day, he was talking about people who were of the night, and he was talking about how thieves rob at night and so forth, and how we are people of the day. So since we are of the day, let us be sober, that uh, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Then verse 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing you know, if we're going to be strong and healthy as a church, then it's very important for each one of us to be strong and healthy in our walk of faith. Because as each of us goes, so goes the church. But as important as it is for us to look after ourselves and be vigilant in keeping ourselves right before God, it's also very important for others and for us to watch out for others that they also may be strong and healthy in their faith. I know that ultimately we are all responsible for our own walk. When you and I stand before God, it will just be us and God on Judgment Day. I know ultimately we're responsible for ourselves. However, the Bible makes it very clear that we are to be vested in the goodwill and the status of others in the faith. The Bible says we're to love one another, care for one another, Pray for one another, bear one another's burdens, encourage one another, exhort one another, edify one another. And so it's very clear that we're not just to be consumed with how we're doing in this journey of faith, but we're also to be very concerned about how others are doing and looking at what we can do to improve their lives and encourage them along the way to lift them up. And as Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, to build them up in the faith. And so if the church is going to do well, not only do I need to do well and you need to do well, but we need to also encourage others to do well also. This is really true in every walk of life, right? If you're in a drama and one of the actors or actresses 
becomes ill or has a family emergency and can't go on that night, it's going to affect you, and it's also going to affect the entire cast. Or if you're in an ensemble and the percussionist or the violinist or the trumpet player comes down sick, it's going to affect you and also the entire orchestra. Or if you're an athlete and the quarterback injures his shoulder during the week in practice, it's going to affect you and the rest of the team. Because how it happen, what happens to others is going to have an impact on the entire team. And so if we're going to do well as a church, it behooves us to connect with one another, to pour into others, to do everything we can to strengthen their lives and not just lock us our, ourselves up in a little hole or cubby and just say, well, all I care about is how well I'm doing. No, we need to be concerned about how others are doing also. One of the greatest ways that we can pour into the lives of others is through encouragement. Again, 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says to encourage one another and build up one another. Somebody said, you may have never had a minute's training in medicine in your entire life, and yet you still hold in your hand one of the greatest powers of healing known to mankind. And that's the power of encouragement. Encouragement breathes life into other people. It helps them to stand up straight. It gives them confidence. It gives them the ability to be stronger, healthier, <coughs> able to conquer more encouragement, just builds and makes strong. And so when we encourage other people and make that a focal point of our lives, we can make a tremendous difference in the hearts and lives of those around us. And so I want to talk today about how we can encourage each other. And I want to give you four words, they all start with the letter A, that we can all do and practice in our lives to help encourage each other in the faith. All right, the first A is acceptance, is acceptance. Romans 15 and verse 7 says to accept one another just as Christ has accepted you. Now, if you stop and think about that verse, you'll realize that's a tall order. To accept other people as Christ has accepted us. Because think about how Christ has accepted us. He has accepted every one of us, regardless of our background, regardless of our faults, our failings, our weaknesses, regardless of all the bonehead mistakes we've made, regardless of where we've come from, our family history. He's accepted us. And he says we need to accept one another. Just as Jesus has accepted us. So it's a challenge, isn't it, to accept other people sometimes? Especially people that maybe have varying viewpoints than what you have. There are a couple of obstacles, I think, that sometimes get in our way. Well, there are many of them, but I'm going to mention a couple of them today. That get in our way of accepting other people. One of them is, we live in a very uh, put-down, insult-driven culture today. Have you noticed that? And it can make it difficult to accept people because we insult people that we don't like. We tear down people that disagree with us. You know, sitcoms have made a living with this for many years, right? Many comedians, that's how they make their dough, by putting down other people and making fun of and mocking other people. Um, the word sarcasm literally means the cutting of the flesh in the original language. And yet we make a living with that. And, you know, I, I understand to some degree. I mean, I, we all do it some, right? We all have a little fun. We all have little jabs we give. We do it in fun. But it's one thing to do it in fun. It's another thing to mock, to poke fun of, to ridicule, and to tear down. That's entirely different. I haven't verified this, but I heard that if you go to a fish market and you go and check at the, the crab barrel, I guess they have those. <laughs> They've got to keep the crab somewhere, right? That they don't have a lid on it. Because if a crab starts to try to make his way out, all the other crabs will grab at it and pull it back down. So they don't have to put a lid on the crab barrel. 
And I'll be, yeah, sometimes that's how we are. We're just pulling people down, just dragging them down. I don't know if it makes us feel like we're above them or not, if we push other people down, but it doesn't. But we sometimes do that. We'll put people down. And you see a lot in social media. You know, somebody doesn't agree with you, so you attack them. Somebody has a different viewpoint, so you tear it apart and tear them down with no concern for their personhood. We just tear down. And we need to be careful of that. We need to accept people. Which brings me to my second thought concerning obstacles that prevent us sometimes from accepting people is that we have a difficult time accepting people who have different viewpoints than we do. Somebody believes in capitalism, somebody else believes in socialism, somebody else believes in communism, and on and on it goes with all the isms, and we just cannot talk to anybody that has a different viewpoint than we do. Or somebody has a different political viewpoint than we do, and we don't want to talk to them. Or somebody has a different idea on cultural norms, and we just don't talk to them, and we don't accept them. And I don't know how we've gotten to this point in America where we just can't talk to anybody who differs from us, even on theological viewpoints sometimes. Even Christians sometimes will be standoffish toward people who have different theological positions. But we need to be accepting of people. You know, we rub shoulders with people in the community, on the job, in the market, at church, who see things differently than we do. But we need to accept them. And you can still talk to them. You can still be cordial to people. Yeah, you can be cordial to an atheist. You talk about differing viewpoints. Well, that doesn't mean you need to shut them out. You can still talk with them and accept them as a human being. <coughs> accept one another just as Christ has accepted you. Sure, you may disagree. It, it was strong emotion inside. But you can still treat them with dignity and Christian love. Accepting one another doesn't mean you necessarily agree with them or that they're going to do the things that they do. They may live a lifestyle that you consider vile. They may go out drinking and carousing every night. They may not be there for their family. You may disagree with that, but you can still talk to them, be cordial, show them the love of Jesus. That's accepting people. Again, it doesn't mean you support what they're doing. But we can accept one another. And show the love of Jesus. It's an opportunity for us to share the love of Jesus with people who so desperately need it. And it's true in the church. Accept one another. Even in the church sometimes, we can have difficulty accepting people, right? Because we all come from different backgrounds. And we all have different personalities. And sometimes we know, I mean, the way people do things in their life, but we can still accept one another and be friendly toward one another. It's very important. Because that's one way we can encourage one another, because it's terrible to be unaccepted. To feel like you don't connect. To feel like you're the outsider. And so by accepting everyone, it helps everyone have a sense of belonging. One of the greatest needs we have is to have a sense of belonging. And if someone comes into our church body and we don't accept them and they're on the outside, they know it. And it won't be long before they're gone. So we need to accept one another. A second A is the word attention. Now this one takes more time than acceptance because acceptance is an attitude inside. Attention is the action. It's the act. So once you've accepted somebody, then the attention is going to require time. See, your acceptance is an attitude of the heart. But when you get them attention, that's an action. And so that's going to take some time. You accept somebody, then the tension is you listen to them, you talk to them, you spend time with them. I'm not saying you take them out to dinner or invite them into your home, but you take time to them, ask them how they're doing, form a friendship, or at least an acquaintance type of relationship with them. And it takes a little bit of time, a little bit of attention to do that. Have you ever been in a situation where you didn't feel like anybody was giving you any attention? You walk into a room full of people, and it's like you're invisible. Nobody acknowledges you. Nobody says hello to you. It's a terrible feeling, isn't it? It's almost like you just want to crawl into a hole or just leave. It's terrible not to be shown any attention. That's how important it is for us to be giving attention to other people because we ought to know how it feels when we don't receive attention. We feel like, what am I even doing here? Nobody even cares that I'm here. And have you ever noticed that those things that we pay attention to grow? 
If you pay attention to your marriage, it's going to grow. If you pay attention to your children, they're going to get stronger and healthier. If you pay attention to your garden, it's going to be healthy, right? The things you pay attention to grow. But if you don't pay attention to your marriage, it's going to fall apart. If you don't pay attention to your kids, they're most likely going to rebel. Things we pay attention to grow. Mary Kay Ash, you all know who she is or was? I'm not sure if she's still alive. The founder of Mary Kay Cosmetics? No, she's not still alive. But she made this comment. She said, everybody walks around with an invisible sign hanging around their neck that says, make me feel important. Well, that's an interesting comment. Everybody walks around with a sign hanging from their neck Invisible sign that says, make me feel important. Could you imagine if you came to church and everybody you saw, you pictured a sign hanging around their neck that said, make me feel important. Now, somebody might say, well, that's self-serving. Well, I don't think it is. I think it's an innate desire that we all have, a need to feel like we belong somewhere and that people value us and that we are worth having around. I think that's just something that God gave us. We want to feel important. We want to at least feel accepted. and something we all need. And so a little attention would go a long way. Stop and say hello. I think about how come we don't give attention to people sometimes? Well, sometimes we're just too self-absorbed. All we care about is ourselves. So we walk around just taking care of us. Sometimes we just don't care. We walk by somebody, I don't really care about them. So we just walk on. And I think another reason is we get too much of a hurry. So we just rush, rush, and we're not thinking about others. But you know, whenever you're in a rush, you pass more than you ever catch. And so why don't slow down a bit? Let God do a work in our heart and realize that everybody's important so we can start caring if we haven't already been doing so. And not get so self-absorbed. But maybe you see somebody, maybe even, you know, there might be somebody in this church that you've never even said hello to. I don't know, I'm just guessing. Maybe somebody sits on the other side and you never cross paths. Well, maybe go out of your way and say, you know, I've seen you around, I just haven't really talked to you. Or maybe it's been six months since I've talked to you. And give a little attention. It goes a long way. Okay, the third A is the word affection. Now, I want to be very transparent with you here and tell you that I almost left this one out. I almost replaced it with something else because this is a very sensitive subject and I want to make sure I communicate correctly. We live in a world where there is a lot of inappropriate affection. Uh, you know, 40 years ago, you could probably teach on this and nobody would blink an eye, but today there's so much in the media and so much that has happened with inappropriate touching, sexual harassment, even criminal activity. And so it makes you, you know, hesitant to even talk about. And I got to thinking about it and praying about it, and I thought, well, just because there are people that do it wrong doesn't mean we should ignore what's right. It's kind of like if there are reckless drivers out there, that doesn't mean that we should all stop driving, right? So just because there are a lot of people who mess it up doesn't mean we should ignore what is right. Now, what am I talking about? Well, I'm, let me walk through what I'm not talking about first. <laughs> the Bible says to greet one another with a holy kiss. I'm not talking about that. In 21st century America, in our culture, that would not go over well. And so I'm not talking about that. Also, working in, in a, well, I'm trying to think how to describe it. Going from the most affection to the least, let me go that direction. Okay, the next one down is, is hugging. Let me talk about hugging for a moment. I'm not necessarily talking about that. Uh, not necessarily that it's wrong to hug, but let me explain. Not everybody's open to hugging. Um, I knew a couple one time where the husband, man, he was a hugger. He came from a family where they showed affection all the time, and he would hug anybody and their brother. If you brought a dog to church, he probably would have hugged your dog. And, and just a friendly guy. He wasn't weird or unusual. He was just a nice guy. He was fun, and he'd give anybody a hug. It was great. His wife was just the opposite. She grew up in a family where they didn't show affection, and she didn't like hugs, and she didn't give hugs. 
And they were, they were just very different. Um, so you have to be careful. For me personally, I will not initiate a face-to-face -face hug with a female. Well, with my wife I will. I like that. I may linger a while too. So yeah, I don't have to worry about embarrassing her today because she's in Kansas. She went to a teacher's training conference and so I don't have to worry about embarrassing her. But that's all right. But other than that, I won't initiate a face-to-face -face hug with a female for a couple of reasons. One, not every female is going to welcome that. And I have to remember, there are some women who were abused when they were younger, and they don't want to be hugged by men. And I get that. So I'm not going to intrude on someone's face that way. A second reason is because as a man, and as a husband, and as a Christian, and as a pastor, I don't want to send the wrong message. And so I'm very careful about that. So I won't do that. Again, I'm not saying it's wrong to hug that way, but for me personally, I'm not going to initiate anything like that. A side hug is much less threatening, so, you know, that's an option. But, again, I'm saying all that to say this. When I talk about affection here, that's not what I'm talking about. Here's what I'm talking about. It's very simple. I'm talking about a touch on the back or on the arm. You know, when you're talking to somebody or when they're walking by. In fact, I gave a conscious thought this morning because I'm preaching on this. And I, all of the, those of you who I've been close to today and shaking your hand, I think 90% of you, I also patted you on the back or touched you on the arm. And there's a connection there that comes, at least from my viewpoint and from things that I've studied. I was sitting over in the fellowship center one day, probably about a month ago, and you know, around one of the tables, and somebody walking by said, hello, Pastor William, and they put their hand on my shoulder and walked by. And that, I don't know, it just made me sit up straight and thought, wow, you know, they didn't just say hi there, but they took the time. They touched my shoulder and went on, and it just does something. It's something about that physical touch just for a moment that creates a connection. That's what I'm talking about. There have been a lot of studies on the power of touch. And let me share a few of them with you. One of them goes way back 800 years. You're not going to believe this. This is really crude. There was a ruler named Frederick II who actually would do experiments on human beings, which is um, it's sickening, really. And he did this one where he wanted to see what language babies would speak if no one ever spoke to them, which is stupid. And bizarre because my brain and my reasoning would tell me they wouldn't speak any language because they wouldn't hear it. But he didn't know, do children speak the language they hear or is it just innate in them? Well, duh. How can it just be innate? They have to hear it to learn it. That's why they learn different languages around the world. But he did this stupid experiment. And these babies had caretakers given to them, assigned to them, but these nannies, if you want to call them that, were only allowed to feed them and bathe them or clothe them. And they were not allowed to speak to them at all, no words. And they were not allowed to hold them, cuddle them, caress them, anything. It was just feed them and clothe them. That was it. All 50 of those babies died. Now that is a horrendous experiment to do. That's the kind of person this king was. There have been modern experiments done, not experiments, but studies, I should say. Modern studies done that have shown the power of physical touch. In Miami, there were premature babies that were born where they did a study over some time, a year or so or two, and they realized that those babies who had family that continually came in and touched their babies and spoke to their babies and held their babies, those babies thrived and those babies developed stronger mentally and physically as a result. I talked about this in Ohio one time, and a woman in our church sent me an email that week, a very nice email, and here was her story. She, she and her husband adopted a little boy back in the 1980s who uh, was born prematurely. He was eight months early. No, eight months. <laughs> no. Wow. That would be a miracle. He was uh, eight weeks early, and uh, he weighed two and a half pounds. Okay? He was eight weeks early, weighed two and a half pounds. And the staff at the hospital told my friends who were adopting this little boy, they said, we'd like for you to come in twice a day and touch him, 
caress him. He was in an incubator at the time, so they couldn't hold him, I don't think. But just touch him, caress him, talk to him. And we want you to do it twice a day. Well, he was in the hospital for nine weeks. I figured that out. That's 126 trips to the hospital. Now, they probably stayed over at times, but still, that's a lot of visits to the hospital. But, you know, for a child that you love. And they did that every single day. And my friend said it contributed tremendously to his health, both physically and mentally. And it's powerful. The power of the touch. There have been studies done at supermarkets. You know where they hand out samples? You know, where the person, where they're trying to sell their product? And they have determined that when a customer is just touched briefly on the arm or on the upper arm, just briefly by the employee, they're more likely to purchase the product because of the connection that's made. It's just that little bit. Just a, a touch on the arm and you're walking by or on the back, and that little bit of connection makes a difference. It really does. You may not even think about it sometimes, but you have a powerful tool just to touch. And so when it's done right in an appropriate manner, in a godly way, for the purpose of encouraging, it can go a long way. Okay, number four is appreciation. Appreciation. We all need to be appreciated, whether we realize it or not. And you know what appreciation is, right? It's just to raise the value of something. Like in the material world, if you buy a house and it appreciates, what happens? The value of that house goes up. If you've ever bought a car, you know what depreciation is, right? Because as soon as you drive it off the lot, that car begins to depreciate. That means when you go to sell it later, it's going to be worth much less than what it was when you paid for it, when you bought it. That's depreciation. So when you appreciate somebody, you raise their value. You make them feel more important. You make them feel more worthy and have more worth and more confidence when you appreciate somebody. People will do a lot more in an atmosphere of appreciation than they will in a spirit of criticism and put-downs. I believe that with all my heart. The more you appreciate people, the more you'll get out of them. The more they'll do because they feel that value and confidence in them. Have you ever heard anybody say this? Probably said it yourself. I just feel so unappreciated. I just feel so unappreciated. All right? That statement right there shows you how important appreciation is. The very fact that we say that out of frustration, I feel so unappreciated. That tells you how important it is. If it irritates us that much, if it makes us feel that badly because somebody doesn't appreciate us, that tells you how important it is. So it's important, if it's important to you, just think what you can pour into others by appreciating them. Saying, hey, I appreciate what you did. I appreciate you doing that for us. Or writing them a little thank you note, sending it in the mail and surprising them. Say, you know, I really appreciate this about you. Fill in the blank. It goes a long way. William James said that one of the greatest principles of, of human nature is the craving for appreciation. And he didn't say the, the wish or the desire to be appreciated, but he said the craving. We all crave it. We want to be appreciated for who we are and what we do. And John Wooden was the basketball coach at UCLA. Many people consider him the greatest basketball coach ever. And he understood the power of appreciation. And he gave this instruction to his basketball teams. He said, if somebody passes you the ball that enables you to score a basket, he said, when you're going back down the court to the other end, I want you to turn to that player who threw the pass, and I want you to wink at him or point at him. Because the power of appreciation. Because, you know, the guy who makes the baskets is the one who gets all the glory, right? So-and-so scored so many points. That's what they talk about. They don't talk about assists that much. It's the guy who scores the points. And so the guy who gets the assist, he doesn't get as much attention. So he said, I want you to point at him or wink at him when you're going back down the court to let him know you appreciate it. Well, he was giving that instruction to his team one time, and one of the players raised his hand, a new player, and he said, Coach, what if he's not looking at me when I point at him? And John Wooden smiled, and he said, Oh, don't worry. He will be. 
You see, he knew the power of appreciation. He knew everybody wants to be appreciated. And so they're going to wait and they're going to look. Because they want to be appreciated. And so these are some of the ways that we can connect with each other. I think sometimes in a church we just assume that connection has taken place. And it may be, may not be. I wouldn't be surprised, and I'm just guessing here, that there are some in our congregation that maybe don't feel as connected as others. You say, well, who are they, Pastor? Well, I don't know, because people don't just come up and tell me they don't feel connected every day. But I know in a group this size that there probably are some that don't feel connected. Some of you feel very connected. Some of you may be about in the middle, and then some of you maybe feel a little on the outside. I say that to say, don't just assume that everybody feels real closely tied. So let's go out of our way and do what we can to bring all into a good sense of connection. Because again, I think sometimes we come here on Sunday and just assume, well, everybody just feels connected. You can go to a church week after week after week and still not feel connected to the body of believers. So don't just assume that everybody around you, the person sitting next to you on your right or left or in front of you or behind you or maybe on the other side of the sanctuary might be here today and maybe they've been attending here for years. They just don't feel connected. So do these four things. Show them attention. Accept them. Appropriate touch. Appreciation. To even people, maybe again, that you haven't even talked to in a long time. Or someone that you think, oh, they've got to feel connected. They've been coming here for years. Well, sure they have. Maybe they don't feel connected. So reach out. Don't just assume. Let's make this a job every week, every time we're together, to reach out and make others feel connected. Let's stand together as we pray. Our Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the family of God. We love the church. And Lord, even with the, the, the flaws and the, the weaknesses,